Welcome to NumPy Techniques and Practical Examples. My name is Christopher, and I will be your guide. This course is all about NumPy and shows you four real-world examples of how you might use it and things you can accomplish with it. If you've never done NumPy before, it might be better to take an intro course first, but I will walk you through all the functions I use in case any of them are new to you. Along the way, you'll learn how to create multidimensional arrays in NumPy, how to load CSV data into an array, how to create an array of a given shape but filled with zeros, how to create a new array based on an old one but with a change and pretend that you're modifying it, how to add structural information to arrays, and how to use that to join row information between two existing arrays. You'll also see a quick intro on creating a bar graph from NumPy data, and finally how to perform vector operations on NumPy columns, including how to write your own custom vectorized function. This course was tested using Python 3.13, NumPy 2.2.1, Matplotlib 3.10, and I very briefly use version 8.4 of the NatSort library. This course presents four practical examples using NumPy. Those examples are creating a multidimensional array where each dimension is populated from a separate CSV file, using structured arrays and how to run an SQL-like join operation known as reconciliation, building a bar chart in matplotlib with numpy data, and finally running vector operations on columns of numpy data, including writing your own custom vectorized function. Next up, I'll dive in and get started by showing you how to create a multidimensional array in numpy. In the previous lesson, I gave an overview of the course. In this lesson, I'll do a quick intro to NumPy arrays in case you need some review. The code in this course requires three different third-party libraries, and as such, you should be using a virtual environment. If you're new to virtual environments, I recommend you take a read of this tutorial to get you started before proceeding. The three libraries used in this course are NumPy, which is where I'll be spending most of my time, then matplotlib to do some charting, and one single but helpful use of the NatSort library, which has an alternate way of sorting things like file names. You can install all three using a single pip install command inside of your activated virtual environment. NumPy has its own data types that are in addition to the regular Python data types. The core concept that you'll be using over and over in this course is the NumPy array. This is a list-like structure, which is fixed in size. Once you've created it, that's how big it's going to be. There are ways of pretending to insert something, but what is really happening is a new version is being created, and the old version is being copied into it. For small items, this doesn't matter, but for large amounts of data, there are speed and memory considerations to think about when doing this. Now, of course, that sounds like a drawback, but it comes with a really, really big upside. NumPy is screamingly fast. If you need to crunch a lot of numbers, a NumPy array is going to outperform any equivalent list pretty much all the time. NumPy is built for doing number crunching, and as such, its array concept is homogenous. That means it contains the same kind of data. This isn't as restrictive as it might sound. You can have multiple columns, and it is the column that has to be homogenous. So you can kind of think of it like a spreadsheet where each column in the sheet can only contain a single type. This restriction is another reason for NumPy's speed. Essentially, you're trading off the greater flexibility of the Python list for high-grade performance. Let's go into the REPL, and I'll show you some NumPy arrays. NumPy has a lot of stuff in it, and rather than import the whole thing into the namespace, the convention is to reference it directly. And as programmers are lazy and don't want to keep typing NumPy, the import typically aliases it as NP, which I've done here. The NumPy array is a class, even though its name is lowercase, and you can instantiate it directly. By passing a list into the array, like I've done here, I've instantiated it to be a single dimension array with the values 1, 2, and 3 inside of it. Let's take a look at it. NumPy displays an array similar to how you construct it. Like with a list, you can use square brackets to access an item in an array. Also like lists, the index is zero-based, so I've accessed the second item in the array here. Note that it shows a 64-bit integer with a value of 2. This is a NumPy type rather than a regular Python integer. 
NumPy numbers play fairly well with Python numbers. If you add a Python integer to a NumPy int, you'll get the correct value as long as it fits inside the 64 bits used to store it. Arrays can be multidimensional. Let's create a two-dimensional structure. Like before, I use the constructor, but this time I'm using a list of lists. This is how you get the two dimensions. So now I have two rows and three columns. This is what it looks like. Once more, NumPy uses the list-like notation to show you what is inside. I mentioned before that arrays have a fixed size. If you need to incrementally add data, one approach is to start with an array with the correct dimensions filled with zeros, then overwrite the values that you need. This is so common that NumPy provides an array factory called zeros. The argument to zeros is a shape value. This is a common mechanism in NumPy that indicates the size of dimensions. A single integer, like here, means one dimensional with that size. So in this case, three values in a single row. You can see the shape of an array object by accessing its shape attribute. Our array named one is one dimensional with three values inside of it. And our array named two is two dimensional with two rows and three items in each row. You can pass a shape tuple like this to the zeros factory to create multi-dimensional arrays. This has the same shape as our array named two but has a value of zero for each item. For more dimensions, simply add more items to the tuple. This is a pre-populated three-dimensional array with lengths three, two, and three, respectively. Now that you've reviewed NumPy arrays, next up, I'll dive into the actual example, populating multi-dimensional arrays from multiple CSV files. In the previous lesson, I showed you how to create multi-dimensional arrays in NumPy. In this lesson, I'll show you how to populate those from multiple CSV files. As I showed you in the last lesson, the NumPy array object is multi-dimensional, and you can see how many dimensions it has and how large each is by accessing its shape attribute. This is a tuple with each value in the tuple being the size of the corresponding dimension. Now, let's say you actually want to create a two-dimensional array from some existing data, like two one-dimensional arrays or two lists. One way to approach this problem is to use the concatenate function. But the downside of this approach is it requires three arrays in memory, the two one-dimensional arrays and the resulting combined one. For large data sets, this can mean a lot of memory and a bunch of compute time to do the copying. And of course, this just gets worse if you want to go into three dimensions, which is what I'm going to show you how to do. Say you have three CSV files, each with row and column data, which when combined produce your desired three-dimensional array. Instead of creating three two-dimensional arrays and combining them, you create a zeroed array of the correct size and then read each of the CSV files, overwriting the appropriate part of the 3D array with your data. This approach takes a bit of computing power to replace the parts of the final array, but memory-wise, you have less space being taken up at any given time. This slide visualizes our approach. Three files named file one, two, and three.csv contain slices of our final array. These get combined into a three-dimensional chunk. To get the desired result, I'll create an array filled with zeros, loop over each of our data files, and replace the data from there. Let's go to the REPL and try this out. If you're following along, you'll either need to create the three CSV files here on the screen, or you can download all the files, including the sample code from the supporting material dropdown just below the video player on your screen. The pathlib library has useful tools for dealing with file names. So I'll start by importing the path class from it. Then of course, I'll need NumPy. Once again, aliasing it. And now to get started, I need a three-dimensional array of the correct size. I'll use the zeros factory call, which I covered in the previous lesson, to create such a thing. And there's my array, filled with zeros. Python's id function shows a unique identifier for an object instance. I'm doing that now just to show you that no array copies will get created as I go along. After I'm done messing about, our array will be the exact same one. Okay, 
Now it's time to loop over each of our three files and stick them in the array. That's a lot, and a bit messy. Let's go through it a bit at a time. About two-thirds of the way through our loop declaration is the path class calling CWD. That's short for Current Working Directory, and returns a path object for the directory that this code is running in. That object then has the glob method called on it, which returns an enumeration of path objects whose file names match a pattern. The pattern here is file question mark CSV. So our three file one, two, and three files get matched and returned. All of this is wrapped in enumerate, meaning you'll get a path object and a count for each of the matching files. Inside the for loop, I use the counter to replace one dimension of the existing zeroed array with the results from NumPy's load.txt call. As you might guess, this call loads data from a file, and with the delimiter parameter set to comma, this is essentially reading a CSV and returning a corresponding array. And that's pretty much it. Our array now contains the data from the files. Let's take a look. And there you go. Three beautiful dimensions populated from three different CSV files. And as you can see, the ID of the array object hasn't changed, so no array copying has happened. The total memory of this approach is the sum of the final result array plus whatever temporary storage the load TXT call needs. That can still be a lot, but it's far less than having every single dimension resident in memory at the same time. Sometimes you want to muck with the structure of your array. In the next lesson, I'll show you how that's done. In the previous lesson, I showed you how to construct a three-dimensional array from three separate CSV files. In this lesson, I'll continue on in that theme, but this time make modifications to the array structure. If you think back to our three CSV files in the previous lesson, what would have happened if one of those files was missing a row? Since you used the zeros factory to create a default array populated with zeros, any missing data would simply be zeros. Now, in some cases, that can be problematic, as zero is also a number, and it can mess with your calculations. But in a lot of cases, it's better to have something than nothing, as nothing often causes your code to fall over. NumPy arrays are fixed in size, but there are helper functions that do array copies, making it act like they can be changed. The insert function allows you to modify the shape of an array. Except that's a lie. It isn't really modifying it. It's creating a brand new array with the new dimensions and using the old one to populate it. As long as you ignore the computation overhead of that operation, you can think of it as a subtle difference. With large amounts of data, you're creating two copies, though, and it's something you want to keep in mind. Let's take our three existing array files from the previous lesson and add some content. I've got a new file called longfile.csv, which has one more row than our other files. To incorporate this new data, you need to change the shape of the array and read in the new values. Note that the shape change means a need for default values for the existing slices that are being modified. Off to the REPL to play with longfile CSV. Bit of Deja. And some Vu to go with it. And like before, I'm starting out with a zeroed array, but this time the shape is different. Noting the ID of the result. And this code reads the three original CSV files in. And this is the result. Note what I've done here. I'm already ready for a fourth slice, but I'm not ready for the fact that the size of the slices will be different. That comes next. To prep for the new content, I'll use insert. The R argument here is short for array. It's not a pirate thing. The obj argument states what slice will be changing. Using two means each of our four slices will have an additional row. 
The value argument says what to use as the new default, and the access argument states which access to insert the arguments along. And there's the result. Each slice now has an additional row, each filled with zeros. Now I can read in longfile.csv. I've read that into index 3, which is, of course, the fourth slice. And this is the result. Note that this result, although still in our variable named array, has a different ID than before. The insert function returned a brand new array, which I then stored over our existing one. The way I used the glob call to load the files made some assumptions about the order of files. That can be problematic, so in the next lesson, I'll show you what to do about that.